Um, so my name is Stefan Nicol. I'm working on uh, Spring Boot. I'm working at Pivotal on Spring Boot and Spring Framework. Um, so before we start, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Um, who doesn't know about Spring at all in the room? I'm assuming you're all Java developers. OK, a few. Um, maybe someone's using Spring Boot already? Raise your hand. OK, pretty much the same amount that those who don't know about Spring. Interesting. Um, so this session is really live coding only. Um, the room is small enough, so if you, if you have a question, just do not hesitate to um, ask directly. We can stop where I am. Uh, no, need to end, no need to wait for the end to, uh, to ask a question. So it, again, no slides anyway. Uh, with, with the lunch time, it's probably useless to show you any slides. Um, so Spring Boot is, is a, a project that exists for a few years now, two or three years. Um, and what we, what we really want to do with Spring Boot is to improve the getting started experience and help you um, building your applications. So there, there are a few things that I'd, I'd like to, uh, few things that I'd like to show you today. Um, so the, the, the session will be split in two main areas. One is how Spring Boot can help you to get started on something, how you can um, um, quickly start actually writing business logic um, value for the application that you are building, and how, how Spring Boot can help you with that. And then I'll show you uh, some of the features that Spring Boot brings, so the added features on top of helping you getting started. And for that, I'm, I'm going to build a simple application with you. Um, so those who know Spring Boot probably knows about that site, right? Those who raise their hands know about that site. Yeah, there's a few. So start of Spring.io is one, um, let's say, one of the things that we do to help you getting started. Um, it's it's a really a simple, super simple, simple website where you can generate an empty project. As you can see, you can choose the build system you want to use, uh, the programming language you want to use. We've seen a session on Kotlin earlier, so if you want to. Uh, if you want to build a Spring Boot application in Kotlin, you can do so. Um, the version of Spring Boot that you want to use, and I refer that as, as a version of a platform, if you will, and you understand why I'm, I'm referring to that explicitly. Uh, usually, when you get started, you just want to go with the latest, and that's what we, that's what we uh, select for you by default. Then on the left, some basic metadata about your project. And the in interesting bits is the thing on the right where you basically shop for dependencies. You shop for things that you want to use to build your app. So for instance, I want to build a web application. Um, I want to build some application that stores some data in a SQL data store for whatever reason. I need a database. Um, I want to secure the um, information that I'm going to expose. And I want to expose some data as REST endpoints. And I want also to add uh, unique features to my app, so management and DevOps related features. That's, that's what the actuator is all about. And we'll see all of those uh, today. So once I'm done, I'm basically generating project, and that's going to download the zip file, and that zip file has a project in, in it. And then you can import that into your ID, right? But I don't want to do this. I, I want to do that directly from the IE. So that, that's a bit key in, 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 the, in the presentation. So I'm creating a new project. Um, as you can see, I'm using IntelliJ IDE. Uh, if you are using STS or NetBeans, we have the same. You'll find the same features. So there is a plugin for NetBeans, and there is a plugin for Eclipse STS. Same thing. So basically, that's going to contact the service. And for now, I'm just going to choose web. Um, and I'll call that JDK.io. So this is going to do the same thing, effectively contacting the service with the dependencies that I've chosen, um, get the zip file for me, extract the zip file where I'm uh, in the location I've specified, and configure the project, project for me. So I can basically start coding. Everything is ready for me. So I have an, an, an empty app. And as you can see, a Spring Boot application is it's quite simple. It's a main class, really. So if you want to run a Spring Boot application, regardless of the fact it's a web application or not, and that's key, um, you just invoke a main class, and the application will start. Since we are 
here for an intro. Uh, let's see what happens when I'm, since it's a web application, let's create a basic HTTP endpoint for this application. So I'm going to create for that a controller. Um, so those who don't know about Spring, I'll explain quickly what that does. So what I want to do is I want to create a REST controller. So there is a way to flag that in Spring, that component as a REST controller by using that annotation. And then I can add mappings methods. Uh, so one mapping method I want to create is a very simple one. It's a, sim it's, um, it's a mapping that just returns a string, very basic. And I'm going to map that to the root of my application. Okay. So this effectively register a new component on s a new HTTP endpoint, sorry, on slash, uh, which will be which will be invoked, and um, that's going to return a simple string in print text. Again, those, uh, this is where you as a developer make a difference by adding the business logic, uh, implementing the business logic for your application. So I'm not going to show stuff that are complicated from a business logic point of view. What I want to show you is how Spring Boot helps you to bring that together and have actually something that, that runs. So I'm going to run that. And again, um, so IntelliJ ID has created a run configuration for me automatically. And if I go on 8080, I basically get an app. Okay. So that's that's the getting started experience that you have with Spring Boot. So um, you may have a few questions at this point. Uh, first question is where is the um, servlet container? Right. I'm starting something that isn't on HTTP. Where is it? The answer is it's within the application. So what we use in this case, by default, we use Tomcat. We use the embedded API of Tomcat. So we have a few the, the, the necessary Tomcat libraries um, to basically start an HTTP server and um, configure the infrastructure for you. If you've used Spring in the past, you know that to configure Spring MVC, there are many steps that you have to, uh, uh, to fulfill before actually having an application running. So you need to, cr to create a configuration for the dispatcher servlet, then you need to build a WAR file, then you need to download whatever servlet container you want, then you need to copy that WAR file to the servlet container and start the servlet container. All those steps, uh, we want that to go away and just to let you, let you code in the ID. So you may wonder also um, um, what that means if you actually need to ship a WAR file. Um, so I'm going to, to show you that very quickly. Here you can choose the packaging type of your app. If you want to build a WAR file, you can. And of course, Spring Boot is not a framework to build web applications, so you can build whatever application you want. You can build a command line tools, a batch application, a, a daemon, or whatever. But it's more interesting for the sake of the demo to show you a web app. So, um, Let's go back to the dependency section for a bit, and then I'll explain the platform, what I mean by platform. So if you look at your project now, uh, there is not much. There is two dependencies that we call starters. And starters in the Spring Boot world is a way for you to get the necessary dependencies to implement a use case. So a w I want to build a web application, so I'm going to bring the web starter. And the, what the web starter is going to give me is the runtime, so the, the embedded Tomcat container in this case. Uh, Spring MVC, so that I can actually create, I can code against the API, I can create a controller. And also what you, what you get is um, things like the validation API, because we feel that if you build a web application at some point, you'll have to validate from input. So it's something that usually you, 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 will, have to, uh, you will have to use at some point. Of course, you can disagree with any of those, so you can choose not to use the starter infrastructure at all and just add the, the bits yourself. Uh, you can choose not to want to deploy your app on Tomcat and just decide and choose a different servlet container. So you can choose Jetty or Undertow. Um, but, but the key here when, you get, when you're getting started, you basically select a starter and will bring what it needs to, for you to, uh, to implement that use case. You also notice that there is no version here on the starters, uh, the, the main reason behind it is because all the versions are managed by Spring Boot itself. So not only we will manage uh, Spring libraries, but also all the third party libraries that we support. And if you've built, and I'm sure you, I'm sure you've, you did, 
if you've built a, an application in the past, you know that making sure that all those libraries work together, so you basically need to chase which version of X works with which version of Y. And when you upgrade X because you need a new feature, all that area of your application is broken because something is not compatible again anymore. And what Spring Boot does, does, it does all that work for you. So it will basically chase those down those dependencies, making sure to find those that are working together. And that's, that's where Spring Boot is a platform. Um, and what that means concretely is when you upgrade Spring Boot, you also upgrade your technical stack at the same time if you choose to go with the default version, of course. Right. <coughs> One more thing is, uh, if you want to debug this, this web application, what should you do? If you want to debug it, you press the debug button. So if you want to debug a web application today, you know that you need to go with the remote debugger, you need to set some properties in your, in your application so that it stops the application you can connect with remote debugging, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So with Spring Boot, you don't have to do any of that. Okay, so let's showcase now what you what you should do if you want to add some feature, more features to your app. So now I want to persist some data. I want to basically have a JP entity, a JPA repository, and I want to expose that JPA repository uh, as a REST endpoint. I want to do that. So how do I do? So first thing is you need the necessary dependencies to do that. So again, as I explained, one way to do that is to shop for a starter that does it, that provides the necessary uh, feature. There is one that's called data JPA. And I want also to expose my repository as a REST endpoint since I have a web application, so I can do that as well. Next, I need to Persist the data somewhere, and of course we can't make that choice for you. So we can't say uh, if you use data JPA, you are going to use MySQL, for instance, or if you use data JPA, you're going, you're going to use PostgreSQL or whatever. We can't make that call, so we we don't make it, and you, you basically have to choose one. So for the sake of the demo here, I'm going to uh, choose H2, uh, which is a simple uh, simple enough uh, database for the sake of this of this demo. Okay, now I have those dependencies, so I need to code a bit, a few things. So a domain, a domain object that I have prepared for you. So you've all done JPA, right? So nothing very interesting here. It's a simple entity, a speaker entity with some uh, basic value. Okay, nothing interesting. Again, that, that's the added value that you bring. And I'm going to create a repository for it. So the repository is using uh, um, one of the one of the project of the Spring portfolio called Spring Data and uh, Spring Data JPA in this case. That's what the Spring Data JPA starter brings. And once you have that, you can define your uh, repositories as interface. You can extend from base repositories that will give you. Um, the most common features. So for instance, here I'm extending from a CRUD repository from Spring Data, which will bring me standard operations to get the data, uh, so uh, purge the data, update the data, delete the data, etc., etc. So I'll, I'll, I'll have some pre-provided pre, um, pre uh, methods for that, and I can, of course, create my own. Um, and as you probably guess, uh, the the Spring Data JPA is going to create the queries for you based on the method signature. So in this case, I'm, I'm asking for a speaker, because the return type is a speaker, whose Twitter account is the Twitter account I pass up as, as a parameter. Again, um, this is really nothing to do with Spring Boot. You can do that without Spring Boot. Uh, but what I want to show you is how Spring Boot helps you to collect the things that you're basically implementing, developing, and configure them for you. Last thing I need is I need some data, so I'm going to cheat a bit. You probably know about that feature if you've used Hibernate in the past. So Hibernate, if there is a imported SQL file at the root of the class path, it's going to read that and just execute it. And in this case, I'm basically uh, adding some, some fake data to, uh, to my store. 
So running that again, still no config. Um, and that brings me something like this. So it, it, it brings me a new endpoint called speakers. And speakers is um, giving me a few uh, a few of the a few of the speaker in my data store. It's a page of speakers. Uh, I can also um, navigate to other um, features of my endpoint, like the search endpoint. I can find I can find back here my two search methods. You notice the by Twitter here matches um, basically this. So I'm customizing the rest path for that method. And if I'm if I'm if I'm can also execute a search. And that's actually going to invoke my repository and get the data. Again, all this is Spring Data, JPA, or Spring Data REST related. But the key point is you didn't have to write any configuration about that stuff. So that's what Spring Boot does. Spring Boot will basically look at the class path of your project. It will, because you've added the starter dependency, you could also add the dependencies manually yourself. Um, there is, a, uh, there is Spring Data JPA on the class path. There is Hibernate on the class path. You haven't provided a configuration for the Entity Manager factory. Um, even if you did, you probably had to uh, look to Google or Stack Overflow to uh, know how that works. At least, that's how, that's how I do it. But since you haven't provided any configuration, um, Spring Boot will make a default decision for you. And the default decision is to scan um, whatever is defined under the, uh, the Spring Boot application, so this package, come example demo, anything that's under that, um, directly or sub-packages, it's going to find this, uh, this entity, because it's flagged as an entity. It will also find the repository, because it extends from the uh, eSpring Data repository interface. And that's going to uh, configure Hibernate and configure the persistence unit for you. So it's doing all that work. Next up, um, it's a web application. I have a repository here, and I have Spring Data REST on the class path. So I can do something more, and I can expose that repository as a REST endpoint. So I can configure, Spring Boot can configure uh, Spring Data REST to expose the repository. All right? So it's a lot for those who don't know Spring already, but the key uh, the key thing I, I would like you to, uh, to remember is making the difference between the features, so the, the things that Spring Data JPA or Hibernate or Tomcat or whatever brings, and what you need to do to configure that in a running application. And Spring Boot is doing the second thing, mostly. Any question? Digestion is kicking, I see. Okay. All right, so my next step is um, I have a web application now exposing some data, uh, highly sensitive data, um, so I need to secure that, right? So next step is to add security to my web application. And for that, well, uh, no surprise, there is a starter for it. Uh, always the same thing, Spring Boot starter something, and uh, there's a security starter that you can use. What happens if I'm starting this application? Let's see. So I'm not changing anything, right? And I'm still going there. Uh, okay, so I have to log in now. Um, so what, what kind of uh, possible uh, small decisions could we make based on the fact that you want to secure your web applications? We, we can't do anything really, um, let's say, involved, really. Um, so what we do is we secure all your web, all your web applications with basic authentication. And uh, the next step is to, you can see that actually now the application is secured, kind of secured, it's basic security on, in it. The next step for you is to learn how that works and how you can tune that for, or how you can tune that for your own needs. But for now, I need to log in into that application, so um, I need to. I need to basically know the username and the password. So um, anybody has an idea of what the username and password could be? No, nope. that, 
That's a good one, but no. So anything that's configured in Tomcat, no. Because it's a login at the application level. It's not delegating to the uh, Soviet container. Anyone, that's a chance for you to wake up. Sorry? Excellent, excellent. Good, no. No. Wouldn't it go against? No. I'm, I'm giving you one hint. The username is user. Ha 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 ha. Okay, so um, the thing is, we don't want we don't want to store any uh, security information in, in the documentation because that's where you would look for, right? If you if you want to know the default username and password, you need to read that somewhere. And the problem is, if you write that in the documentation, anybody can know that. And if you're lazy or if you're not careful enough, you can actually push an application in that state somewhere and we don't want anyone to be able to access it. So what we do is every time the application starts, we generate a password in the logs. And then you basically have to take that from here and then you can log in. Here we go. So um, the password will change every time you, st you restart the app. And the password will be impossible to remember. Uh, there is only one reason to that. Um, the reason is that you're annoyed enough so that you act on it and you change it. You do something. Because that's not a state you want to be in, right? You, that's, not the, that's not a valid uh, decision for your application in the long run. So this is the first step where Spring Boot doesn't do enough for you. And that makes sense because we can't make that decision. Because if we made such a decision, we'll have to write and you have to explain you. Uh, and we don't want to do that. So I'm going to show you the first one of the ways uh, you can actually teach Spring Boot how to be smarter for your application. So one thing you could do is to write some uh, Spring security configuration. And again, if you don't know Spring, it's pretty, pretty straightforward here. Um, you obviously need to know that you have to extend from that uh, interface. There are, there are a few interfaces that you can use in Spring Security to customize the way the authentication works. But the key is you need to provide your own authentication manager. So the authentication manager is a component in Spring Security that's going to tell you, based on the input, whether or not you actually can log in. And in this case, I'm, uh, for the sake of the demo again, I'm using something very simple. I'm using an in-memory um, authentication manager with two users. And I have this hero user which has uh, two roles and a basic user that only has the user role. Again, it's really not about uh, Spring Security. So uh, if you want to store your, data, your sec security credentials in LDAP, GDBC, whatever, there is plenty of way you can customize that. So this is the first bit of configuration, of user configuration of my app. All the rest happens automatically. Um, so if I log in again, then I can type hero hero and I'm in. Okay? So the key here is if you start using Spring Boot and you've used Spring in the past or you have a Spring project somewhere and you know how to configure XYZ, don't start by putting all your configuration in it, okay? Because you'll realize that maybe, I don't know, 80%, 70% of that can be done automatically with some tuning, and maybe 50% of that can be done automatically without you doing anything. So only add user configuration to your app once you reach a level where actually Spring Boot can't do the thing that you want by default. Okay, so I want to um, basic overview of the of the um, the getting started experience. Um, I want to show you now some features that Spring Boot brings, and for that, yes, there is a starter. It's called Actuator. Don't ask me what Actuator means. I don't know. 
I knew at some point and I forgot. It's written in the developer guide, I think. Oh, there is a Wikipedia article explaining what, what actuator actually means. Um, but yeah, anyway, I don't remember. So once, once you use the, my app is, oh, it's not starting, okay, here we go. Once you add the actuator um, starter, basically a f um, feature that you will always need regardless of the application will be added to your app. So things that you need to have, um, it doesn't matter which app you're building. You need a way to see the configuration, you need a, a way to debug your application, you need a way to get some information about your application. These are the things that you over and over again need to implement, or you need some kind of shared libraries that does it. One thing, maybe you can't read that because it's a, it's a bit small, slash env, it's to get access to the environment. So basically see the, the configuration that this application is using. You want to see how this application has been customized. So you want to, uh, you want to get more info about it because something is not right or you want to make sure that um, uh, some property has been set. And as you can see, I can't access it. And I can't access, I used, to I used to make a joke about this and I can't make it anymore because the, the answer is, is, is on the screen. It didn't used to be on the screen. So I used, in, in the previous version of this talk, I used to ask which role is necessary to be able to access this. And now it's actually written on the page because we thought, okay, maybe we should tell the user up front. So you need the actuator role. And the reason why we do this is we don't want you to give, um, we used in previous version, we used the admin role, and even that was not enough because admin may not, may not mean what we think it means. For you, maybe admin is a certain role, but you don't want that role to be able to access such low level information. So that's why we added a dedicated role for it. So this is the second time uh, I, I basically disagree with Spring Boot. Um, I want, as, as the hero user, I want to be able to access this, and Spring Boot doesn't want me. So what can I do? Well, one thing I could do is I could go here and do this. That will work, right? Agreed? I'm adding myself the role, then I can access it. But I don't want to do that. I don't want, I don't want Spring Boot to force, um, to force my configuration to adapt to what it does. I want my configuration to be applied to what Spring Boot does. And that's the second way of customizing Spring Boot. Every, what we call auto configuration, so every component that basically, that's basically looking in the class path, looking into your user configuration and inferring a default config. Every of those pieces also expose a bunch of properties. And those properties can be customized by the user. There's many ways you can do that. Um, and probably an intro talk is not enough to discuss about all of those. But one way is we have a default, we have a file called application.properties that sit at the root of the class path. And if you put key values in this, uh, we will detect that automatically and we will apply. So we'll basically add those properties to the environment. And by adding those properties to the environment, you have a way to influence how Spring Boot works. Okay, so next step is I need to find the key, right? So the management role um, for the actuator is called actuator, and I want that to be hero. That way I can teach Spring Boot, um, heroes can actually access the actuator endpoints, uh, but you need, to, you need to provide a value to Spring Boot, so you need a key. So what do you do? Um, you probably go on Stack Overflow or, Go or Google, or I heard someone read the documentation once, um, but I'm not sure it's true. Uh, we, don't want you to, we don't want you to do any of that. So one thing we want, to do, we want you to do is to stay in your ID, not switch context. We want you to stay in the same tool because every time you switch context, you lose productivity. So again, uh, you've seen at the, at the beginning, I created a project right from the ID. I can also search for keys right from the ID. I can, I can type role, and then I'll have a bunch of key, matching keys for the thing I'm looking for. And uh, here, comma separated list of roles that can access the management endpoint. Looks like this is what I want. 
And I can say hero here. And if I say hero, and I need to restart the app, and that's, it starts to bug me, by the way. Then and I can access the environment endpoint. So this is the second way. I'm teaching Spring Boot about my particular situation, my app, uh, the decisions that I made. Um, and Spring Boot will adapt its, its auto-configuration to uh, the, the values that I've, that I've provided. By the way, you can find that back here in the environment endpoint, if you can read. So the application config, you, you get a path to the file and the keys that have, are defined in this file. You also have access to the system properties, the environment variables. Um, if you if you use it, if you are using it in, into a WAR file, you also 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 get servlet context init parameters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's a it's a REST endpoint, so um, you can also type the name of a key, and you'll get the actual value that's being used at the moment. So that's quite interesting. If you it's not the case for this one, but if you have a key that can be specified with different values depending on profile or whatnot, you want to know the actual value for this running application. If you type the if you type the key, you'll get the value that's actually being used, regardless of how it's been configured. Um, I can also um, get a thread dump of my app while it's running. Quite quite useful. I can trace the HTTP request of my app. You see the, lat the latest request I did was on dump. You can see the request header, the response header, and the status code. So you can basically get more information about an application that's running. Um, there's also a metrics facility with plenty of ways for you to export those metrics into external systems. So we provide a basic API where you can record uh, counters and you can record values. So for instance, these are counters. So um, you can see now that the, uh, the uh, metrics endpoint is not there because it's the first time I'm okay, invoking it. It's right here. So if I'm refreshing that a few times, then you can see it increases. That's a counter. And you also have values. So this, this is the number of milliseconds of the last response time. What you can do with that is you can export that to whatever management system you have, and um, you can use it to monitor your application any way you like. You can also see that um, we are also exposing data on the fly based on the context of your application. Or said differently, auto-configuration can also detect stuff that have been auto-configured. So, uh, oh, I, I can see that the fact that it's highlight is not really uh, visible here, but what I meant to, to, to show you is those two keys, which shows uh, the connection pool usage of your data source. So at the moment, there are no connection open, and the usage of the uh, data pool is 0%. You can use that as uh, a way to see if the size of your connection pool is big enough, too big, et cetera, et cetera. And we also expose something about the, uh, the process itself. So you can see memory consumed, et cetera, et cetera. I can also get some information about my app, which gives nothing for the moment. Uh, but we could, for instance, uh, use a Git plugin to expose the Git revision of the app, the current Git revision of the app. Or we also provide a build tool integration uh, that allows you to see some information about the build, like the current version, when the, when the application was built, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is you add a plugin in your Maven or Gradle configuration, which will generate a file at compilation time, so either with the git information or the build information, and we will automatically detect that and show that in the endpoint. You can, of course, add your own information if you want. I'm going to show you that in a minute. So the earth endpoint is also something very useful uh, if you want to know um, if your application is up and running properly. If you have a, a dependency to an external service uh, and you want to make sure that external service is alive, it's a very good way to have that information in one place. So again, um, these are this one is detected automatically. Um, the fact that I have a database running, it will figure it out. And uh, every time I'm calling this endpoint, so every time I'm calling refresh here, it's going to check if the database is alive. 
So I want to add uh, an endpoint of my own here, and I want to show you how you can do that. So this is the first time I'm actually coding against Spring Boot API. So remember, everything you know about Spring, uh, you can reuse that. Uh, there is, it's, not, it's not something new you have to learn. Uh, what Spring Boot will do is uh, configure things for you and provide you added features like, like this one. So I want to create um, an extra entry in this list. But before I do that, I want to show you one more thing. I want to add uh, a dependency here called DevTools. Spring Boot DevTools. Here we go. So when I add this, when I add this dependency to my project, I'll get special development only features in my app. Um, let me show you that very quickly. So since I'm building a web application, something that would be very nice um, would be for my application to be connected to my browser. Um, in the purpose of if something has changed in my app, to ask the browser to refresh without me having to do so. Um, there is a, a third party uh, developing a, a, an application called Live Reload. I don't know if you've heard of it, but if you've done web application development, you may, you may know about it. And they offer a free, a free plugin you can install in your browser. Um, and once a Live Reload server is detected, you can basically connect the two. Um, when you add DevTools to your app, a very basic Live Reload server is going to be started as part of your application. What that means concretely, you can't see that. I can, I can barely see it. Um, I'm now connected to my app. So my app is connected to my browser. So what I want to do, I want to show you something, is uh, let's uh, comment it out, that change I've made. And you can see that now I only see partial information. And if I go back to the environment endpoint, I'm back with, you can't access this. So what's happening is when you run DevTools as part of your application, DevTools is watching files you change. And when it detects files have changed, it does what's necessary either to restart the app or to refresh the app. And once this is done, it asks the browser to refresh. So let me show you again. Just saving. I'm moving away from the computer so that I can't cheat and refresh the browser. And now I'm back. With the, with the application as it was before. The key here is to improve the productivity, of course. So you're developing your features within your IDE, and the application will update itself automatically. So you've seen me changing configuration, and that configuration being applied automatically. So let's see what happens. Uh, let's go back to the Earth endpoint first. Here we go. So I can see now the full detail because I have the right to do so. Uh, so let's create a new component in my application. So in Spring, uh, there are many ways to add new components, but one of them is to have a method factory flagged with bean, and whatever is returned is going to be an additional component in the context. So I want to create uh, something called a earth indicator that I'm going to call JDKIO earth indicator. And what I want to do is this, is something very stupid. I want to say, um, let's do this. If this is true, I'm going to say that my app is up. And if it's not true, I'm going to say that my app is down. So it's, it's partly a joke and partly to show you that every time you access the endpoint, that method is going to be called for you. And you can see, again, you have this very nice DSL where you can uh, provide the status of that particular component. And that status on that particular component will have an effect on the general availability of your application. You can add details, uh, whatever you like. So for instance, if there is a specific exception or specific error message, you can pass that so that it, it shows it's, it's being shown. Um, in, in the report. 
So now I have a new endpoint called JDKIO, and the status is down, and the overall status is down. So the, the main status here is down. And if I refresh, eventually, it's going to be up because the random has done its, its things. But again, I've changed some Java code, and my application has refreshed. So that's also DevTools doing that. All right. Any question? Yes. I didn't get that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A way to do what? Like, so the question is, uh, Spring Boot is providing dependency management for a bunch of libraries. You may have a legacy application where the, the dependencies that Spring Boot has chosen conflicts with what your application is currently using. Is there a way to fix that? That's your question? Okay, good. Um, Spring Boot is not going to magically solve that. So if you have an application that's using, I don't know, Hibernate 3.2 and we use Hibernate 5, if your application is not ready to run with Hibernate 5, you'll, there, there will be some work on your end to, to make that happen. So there, there's really two things you, you, you can do. One is to see if Spring Boot may support Hibernate 3. We don't, but we may. Like, for instance, if, uh, there, is, there is currently uh, two versions that we support uh, up to a certain degree, is the 4.x line and the 5x line. So we provide dependency management with 5x. Again, it doesn't mean that we bring Hibernate. We only bring Hibernate when you choose to add either the starter or the dependency in your project. But if you don't specify any version, uh, we will provide a version for you that's compatible with the rest of the platform. So if uh, we provide 5 and we are compatible with 4, if you just set 4 in the version, it will work, as long as your application is working with Hibernate 4. If, you're now, if now you are, you, you are using a very old library that's legacy on, on your end to be able to use Spring Boot or to use any more recent libraries, and it, this is something that you'll have to fix. So one, one key when you migrate what you call legacy application to, uh, to Spring Boot, the, very first, uh, the very, very first step in my mind is to look at your dependencies and how it mismatch with more modern uh, dependency that are available, basically. Do that work in your legacy application and then only migrate to Spring Boot. Other questions? No? Okay. Right, so how do I ship this application, right? Um, I've been in DIDE, and that's also something I wanted, to, I wanted you to remember. I've been in DIDE, I haven't left the ID to build this application. OK, it's very basic from a business point of view, but it also uh, gather a bunch of, of uh, dependencies. Um, it's doing JPA, it's doing security, it's doing REST, it's doing DevOps, uh, it's, it's, it's having a web application in it. So there's plenty of things going on, even though the features are not, uh, let's say, that, that complicated. But it's something you can, you can build on your own. But I haven't left the ID. Right? And that's key. It's really something I would like you to remember. But at some point, I need to, ch to, to ship this application. I need a customer to actually use that. I need to put that somewhere. So you're not going to ship the ID. That's my point. You need a way to run this application. So let's go to the command line for the first time. I should have the application here. Let's just run the, the usual Maven command to package this project, MVN package some test running. So if I want to run this app, you can see my I have two jar files here by default. I have a demo jar and a demo.jar.original. And you can see that there is a different insight between the two. Slight difference. 
So if I want to ship my app, I just run the jar file. Okay? That's the only thing you need to do. And if I go back here, and my app is there again. So if you've, if you've done some, uh, if you've learned Java at university or higher education or whatever, you had to do this at some point, right? Compile a class yourself on the command line, create a jar file where you put some uh, info in the manifest and then run the jar file and your application runs. And you were so happy when you managed to do that. Okay. We have the same history, I see. So um, we want with Spring Boot to go back, with, go back to the basics, go back to the things that works, very simple things. Like if I want to run this app, I run the jar file. And so we have build plugins, again, uh, whether you like Maven or Gradle, we got you covered. Um, so you can choose a build, build tool you like, and you'll get, uh, you'll, you'll get this infrastructure in place for you. Um, we'll, we'll basically run uh, a repackage of the application based on your project dependencies, and we'll build a jar file that contains your application. But there are many things you can do. So for instance, I can pass properties directly here as, as command line switch. Okay, I, I pass something called server.port. You probably guess what that does, right? 7070. And now I have a, an app. I'm not, uh, it's down because the earth indicator said so, by the way. So if I change to anything else, it will ask me to log in again because it's a different, uh, it's a different um, port. So yeah, okay, maybe show the, the most important one is this. So I can see now that I have a command line arguments property source here at the top with the value that I've changed. So I can, I can, I can basically run that jar file and pass properties to it to change the way the application works. So if you've heard of the 12-factor principle, that's one, one way we implement that, where you can have a single uh, unit, a single application, and basically pass the things dependent on the environment so that the application adapts to that. So you could pass, for instance, the, uh, the location of the database that you are using or credentials information or whatnot. Right, that's it. I still have two minutes for questions. Um, other than that, I'm, I will be outside. You can't miss me. I have the Spring T-shirt, right? Um, if you want to chat about Spring, anything related to Spring, I'm happy to, um, to have that discussion with you. Anyway, thank you very much. Enjoy the conference.